Yeah, gonna dive into this pretty quickly uh, and try and do, I, I think I was given about an hour and a half, I think is what, what we're set for time. So uh, we'll try, uh, try, to, try to get through here pretty quickly. Uh, and there we go, all right. So like software delivery itself uh, has never been like more critical to success of an organization uh, in a business in pretty much every industry. Uh, you know, it's what really kind of sets, uh, you know, how well you can perform in that uh, really sets you apart from uh, the other organizations and other companies uh, that are out there. Uh, but those expectations for like delivering something that's high quality uh, have, you know, that have only gotten um, higher. It used to be, you know, that there'd be the smaller groups of people that would have a really high performing team. You got the Netflixes and, and such. Uh, and now that's become the norm. And so those expectations have, have made things a whole lot uh, more difficult, I think, for a lot of engineering teams. But also at the same time, like the landscape of those tools uh, has gotten bigger and bigger. Like this is this, this is the uh, CNCF uh, kind of um, cloud uh, puzzle. Uh, it's probably one way to look at it. And in fact, somebody should make this into a puzzle. Uh, it's like more and more complex, and this keeps keeps changing. More and more things keep getting added to this. So what you know, how are developer teams supposed to kind of figure out? What is really that necessity? What do they really need uh, to you know, succeed and beat out the competition? Uh, so hi, like I said, my name is Jeremy. Um, I am a DevRel and Community Professional. Uh, the reason it says independent is because I am looking for uh, a new job. So if you want to talk about that and what that means, uh, we can chat later. Nice little plug, and you can find me on Twitter. All right, so you know, in this period of immense change that we have, uh, and the global, you know, economic uncertainties that we've all kind of felt over, especially over the last couple of years, uh, has presented a lot of, you know, impacts for, you know, companies of all sizes, whether it's startups all the way up to, to enterprises even. But in this environment that we have, uh, the stability and reliability itself has become increasingly important to businesses. Uh, the ability to provide that, like, reliable, stable platform uh, to customers has become that, that critical kind of value metric for how you know, engineering, engineering teams get measured. And it's only gonna continue to increase uh, as we continue to see things, things change over the coming months and you know, years. So one of the, the core tenets of uh, you know, DevOps and you know, a solid pipeline uh, is really this idea of continuous delivery. It's why we're here, the CD Foundation. If you didn't know, CD stands for Continuous Delivery Foundation. Uh, it's why we're here. Uh, this is just a, a very core principle about even what DevOps is. Um, and so a couple weeks ago, I put out this question of, you know, uh, what does continuous uh, delivery mean? How somebody might want to define that. Anyone want to take a quick stab? Fantastic, everybody's still asleep. Good, all right, well, uh, I got one response. Tracy Miranda, fantastic person. Um, she provided a, a, just a really good definition around, you know, it's this software development practice uh, in which teams release software that changes, uh, software changes to users uh, safely, quickly, and su uh, sustainably. Uh, it's a really great definition, um, and it goes very well with what uh, Jez Humble had to say a few years ago uh, at uh, DevOps Day Seattle, uh, where he talked about like it's that the ability to get changes of all types, uh, including new features, new bugs. Uh, you know, or new bug fixes, uh, you know, getting all those things, those experiments into production or into the hands of users safely uh, and, you know, as quickly as possible in a sustainable way. Uh, in a recent talk given at FinTech, uh, I think it was FinTech DevCon, uh, Charity Majors, who's uh, a CEO at Honeycomb, um, talked to, or C CTO uh, at, at Honeycomb, talked about, like, a list of these modern development practices uh, and with, you know, uh, with the continuous deployment, kind of continuous delivery point, uh, she kind of focused heavily on, you know, the importance of deploying uh, as fast as possible and as automated as possible. Uh, and so, you know, over the last few years, we have seen a jump in companies that are starting to understand that importance, uh, you know, that, that Charity spoke about. But too often, we, uh, you know, see that's been done with kind of this grow at all cost mentality. And when that gets in place, uh, that's kind of starts introducing more and more challenges. And we've seen the, the, um, the cognitive load necessary to keep those systems 
going and in place uh, has gotten more and more overwhelming for uh, DevOps, uh, Dev and Ops teams in order to put that together. And it's led to a lot of cut corners. I think we've all seen, at least I, it seems like, uh, that we've had more and more uh, outages across a lot of the core systems that we use uh, in the industry over the last few years. And I think it's a direct result of this kind of grow at all cost mentality. So uh, some of you are probably familiar of you know, the different kind of industry reports that are out there. Uh, there's state of DevOps reports, state of cloud native, uh, CDF has their you know, state of continuous delivery report. And they're all kind of great for understanding kind of the, um, the industry as a whole, uh, but they also are, are dealing more on survey data. And so what I'm gonna talk about is uh, based off of a report that was done, um, it's the state of software delivery report that was done by a company called Circle CI that kind of dealt with actual raw data uh, and, and kind of able to, to take that along with what some of these other reports go on survey data and understand actually what's happening uh, with actual, you know, um, verifiable uh, anonymized data. So uh, before we kind of even get dive into some of these metrics, I, I want to stress like there is no one size fits all for metrics uh, because everything depends, which is a common DevOps answer, it depends, depends on what you as a company are doing. Uh, what are you building? Who are your customers? Uh, you know, is it more internal, more external? Like there's, there's a lot of things that depend on that. And so there really is not a, um, you know, a, a um, one size fits all. So uh, kind of the four that we're gonna deal with are duration, uh, mean time to resolve, uh, success rate, uh, and then throughput. Those are the four uh, that have been identified as kind of CI, CD, uh, benchmarks for you know what a high-performing team would look like so uh, and then I'm also going to talk about the optimization steps some of those that would be necessary uh, in order to take that strategy and uh, and put a lot of these things in place in order to get to that kind of the holy grail uh, kind of way and hopefully we'll do it without getting uh, concussions as well so. all right so duration that's the first one here uh, it really is that foundation of what like a software engineering velocity uh, would look like, um, but it, you know, this unit of work that's kind of spoken about in the uh, definition doesn't always mean that you're deploying to production. Uh, that could be something as simple as, you know, running a few unit tests to kind of get you, uh, you know, things on a development branch that you can then start to, you know, make some other changes. So it's not just a deploy to production. Uh, and so it's kind of probably the best way of viewing this is as kind of this proxy for how efficiently your pipelines are uh, you know, delivering the feedback on the health and quality of your code that's so essential to, you know, your development teams to be able to um, make the changes necessary. Um, you know, and, and the core kind of promise of most software delivery paradigms, everything from, you know, agile, you know, DevOps, speed, it's all speed. And so that ability to take the information you get from your, uh, you know, customers or stakeholders and, you know, respond quickly and effectively is, is at a core uh, part of uh, the duration. And this rapid feedback and delivery cycle itself is also just, uh, you know, it doesn't just benefit your organizations and users, it's also gonna add benefit to, uh, you know, keeping your developers happy, uh, engaged, and in kind of this uninterrupted state of flow. Uh, but when we exclusively kind of focus on speed, uh, it often comes at kind of the expense of, of stability. So a pipeline that gets kind of optimized to deliver uh, you know, fast, unverified changes is really nothing more than like a highly efficient way of delivering bugs to your system. Uh, so it's important to kind of, um, you know, make sure your organization is not exposed to a lot of that risk and your customers <laughs> don't feel that, uh, is you've got to be able to move quickly with confidence. So, uh, you know, having your pipeline guarded against you know, any potential points of failure, it's important to have a robust test suite. So we'll kind of talk a little bit about that as well. All right, so uh, the duration benchmark, a good rule of thumb uh, that Paul Duvall in his uh, work in 2007 kind of set the stage uh, is, you know, keeping your builds no more than 10 minutes. Uh, many developers who use, you know, CI follow that practice. Uh, and so, you know, it kind of keeps you uninterrupted. Uh, anything longer than that can kind of uh, interrupt the flow. Uh, that's probably about enough time that once you hit push and you, things start building, you go grab a cup of coffee, come back to see what the results are. Uh, as opposed to maybe 30 minutes or longer, and now you're, you know, you're losing kind of that attention span of your developer teams. So among the uh, workflows that were observed in the data set uh, from this report, 50% of them completed in 3.3 minutes or less, 25% uh, 
uh, were completed in you know, under a minute and 75% uh, under nine. But then you know, the 95th percentile, which uh, isn't reflected here, but it, it was right around 11 minutes, which did reflect uh, a lot more of the, um, the 95th percentile. A lot of those um, workflows were taking 27 minutes or more to complete. Uh, so many teams, when we think about you know, ways to improve this, uh, you know, many teams are still kind of continuing to bias towards speed um, rather than robust testing. So uh, the number one important kind of um, thing you need to be looking at when you want to improve this performance across all four of these metrics uh, is enhancing your test suites with more robust test coverage. Uh, so that's, you know, there's a number of, of things here. Uh, I'd say one of the biggest things on this is like code coverage in the pipelines, identifying you know, any of those inadequate testing um, spots that you can help uh, uh, alleviate you know, some of the potential challenges from uh, pushing fixes that weren't adequately tested. So you know, balancing workflow and you know, test coverage, that priorita prioritization is gonna have to take center stage. So you know, that means asking you know, which of these features are really you know, part of that critical path that we need to make sure that we're putting in. Uh, where can you afford more you know, experimentation, uh, maybe on different, different pipelines? Um, so all these techniques kind of here on optimizing, they're really kind of helping uh, getting better buy-in from you know, a lot of your important stakeholders uh, on that right balance between you know, test coverage and workflow speed. Uh, it's okay to have a longer workflow than 10 minutes if you're getting good quality testing feedback. It's also important to know that like when you think about tech, like, duration for builds, um, it's gonna depend on what you're building. Uh, it might take longer if you're having to compile something, it's a big, big application, you're having to compile it uh, as opposed to you're just kind of pushing some website changes. So understanding kind of what your builds are and setting your metric accordingly. Uh, so yeah, so teams that are focusing only on speed, um, they're not only gonna spend more time uh, kind of rolling back all of those broken updates and debugging in production, uh, but they're also gonna face kind of this greater risk to their org's reputation and stability. So optimizing those workflow durations uh, means you're really combining all of these good test practices with uh, you know, efficient workflow. And you all get to dance together. All right, so uh, mean time to resolve. Uh, this is a metric, it's indicative of uh, your team's resilience and your ability to you know, respond quickly, effectively uh, to feedback from your CI system. Uh, so it means that, you know, it really is that best indicator of how mature uh, your org's DevOps kind of adoption is. It's a really quick way to see that. Um, you know, the way that users and most organizations um, kind of see this is, is nothing's more important than your team's ability to recover from a broken build. Uh, so customers are, are definitely more likely uh, to, you know, or they're definitely more unlikely to know um, notice any of those kind of incremental small changes, uh, that steady stream that kind of happens maybe throughout the week, but they're definitely gonna notice when they can't access the website or access that application. So, you know, that keeping the mean time to resolve, keeping, you know, those errors from the system is, is uh, and the recovering from broken builds is extremely important. Um, Martin Fowler uh, kind of talked about this, you know, the, the quickest way is just to get back to the, lead, the last known green build to start with. Uh, and then you can adjust from there. Um, and the whole point of working with you know, continuous integration and, and ultimately that helps deliver that continuous uh, deployment, continuous delivery mindset is you know, you're always developing on you know, the lat, a um, uh, known stable base. So getting back to that green build is, is extremely important there. Uh, it is recommended aiming to fix you know, broken builds on any branch in under 60 minutes. It's kind of what the data shows is what that high performing teams look like. So depending on the scale of like that user base that you have uh, and how critical that application is, uh, your target may be significantly lower or higher. Uh, but this is kind of that sweet spot of what it looks like for a high performing team to be in that spot. Uh, it's gonna allow your organization all to have, also to avoid like the worst outcomes of prolonged failures. Uh, so when looked at, looking at the data from the report, uh, it showed that you know 50% recovery was kind of happening in 60 minutes or, or 64 minutes or less, uh, which was an improvement from previous reports, uh, which was about 10 minutes uh, longer. Uh, the top 25% uh, was in less than 15 minutes, and 50% of them, um, or the I guess the top five, 
fastest five was in less than five minutes. So that's typically you're you're um, you're seeing that with you know smaller um, obviously smaller builds, uh, but probably less uh, feature driven applications. Uh, so the first kind of step to re, you know lowering your recovery time is to treat like the default branch as the lifeblood of your project, as that kind of main um, chalice of what, what everything should be. Um, so your organization is gonna make sure that, you know, when, while red builds are inevitable, you know, getting your code back to green is always gonna be immediately important and it should be everyone in the organization's top priority. Uh, a vigilant culture that you kind of have in place uh, where, you know, everybody is poised to leverage uh, getting back to uh, that green build is going to provide your uh, best chance of staying, you know, hitting those metrics and uh, reducing the impact on your org on your uh, customers. Uh, recovery speed itself is completely bound with pipeline duration. So, uh, you know, the shortest possible time to recovery is going to be, uh, you know, the length of your next pipeline run. So, if your builds your duration and you've identified that your uh, you know, acceptable duration, maybe isn't six, you know, maybe isn't 10 minutes, maybe it's 15. Well, your mean time to resolve can't be any less than 15 minutes uh, because it has to, you know, the build has to run again. So you're never going to hit that metric. So it's an understanding how that, how that fits together. Uh, so along with, you know, mean time to resolve success rate is that other kind of indicator of stability uh, within your kind of app application development processes. Uh, but the impact of your success rate uh, on your customers and developers is really going to kind of vary according to, you know, a couple different factors. Uh, one of those is like, was the, was the failure on a, um, a default or dev branch? Uh, did the workflow involve, you know, a deployment, uh, which there could be an error in the deployment, not really the build, uh, or, you know, how important is that app or service? So that's going to influence, you know, how important uh, and what your success rate when you set your metric is going to look like. A failed signal isn't necessarily uh, indicative of something that's gone wrong as well, um, or a problem that has to be addressed like right now. Um, far more important though is like your team's ability to take that signal in quickly, which comes from that duration metric, uh, and then remediate that error effectively, which is that mean time to resolve metric. Failed workflows that are delivering fast, uh, valuable signals are gonna be far more important than you know, having a passing workflow uh, in the high success rates that have little to no actual information, actionable data for development teams. Uh, maintaining, you know, the success rate benchmark of 90% or more on your, you know, default branches is a reasonable kind of target that we've, uh, that was seen through the report and in previous reports uh, of main co mainline code of kind of a mission critical application um, where your changes, you know, should be merged uh, only after passing a series of well-defined tests. Uh, keep mentioning tests, it's really important for software development. Uh, topic branch failures are generally, you know, less disruptive than those that occur on a default branch. So if your development teams are, uh, you know, doing uh, a lot of innovative work and they're doing it on dev and kind of topic branches, uh, which is where that should be happening, your success rate there is gonna matter less uh, because that's where innovate, that's where you're testing things, where you're trying things out. So having a metric on uh, that you have to hit a certain success rate on your, um, to, you know, your dev branches is not as important as actually having it on your production kind of mainline branch. Uh, so looking at the data, uh, the success rate on uh, the default branch was 77% on average, uh, with you know 67% on the non-default branches. Uh, the trends over the report data uh, kind of showed that success rates on those default have pretty much held steady. And so a, a good standard is that that 90% we're still kind of coming in underneath that. Uh, but we have seen like the pattern of the non-default branches, the success rate there uh, starting to get higher. Uh, and so we're starting to, end, end of starting to see that teams are starting to do a lot more test uh, testing on default branches and doing a lot more development there and less on the, um, on the production branches, which is, you know, what you want to see. <clears throat> so through, throughput uh, is kind of that last metric. And traditionally, that kind of reflects the number of changes that your developers are making in a, you know, 24-hour period. Uh, 
Uh, you're, you know, it's, it's a useful as a measurement of team flow as it really is tracking how many kind of units of work are moving through your pipelines. Uh, but when, you know, you, when you're performing at or around kind of recommended levels, throughput really kind of puts that continuous in what continuous uh, delivery looks like. Uh, because, you know, the higher your throughput, the more frequently you're performing work on your application and getting it out uh, ready to be deployed. Of course, it also doesn't tell you, uh, you know, pretty much anything about the quality of your work uh, that you're performing because it, it, so it, it really is important to kind of consider how rich, again, your test data is um, and as well as how your performance uh, on those other metrics like success rate uh, and duration to get, really get that complete picture of how well your teams are performing. Uh, because, you know, as with duration, a, a high throughput score means little if you're frequently deploying broken code. Uh, so an ideal kind of throughput benchmark uh, really is, it depends. Uh, typical Dev, DevOps answer, I know. Um, but it really is gonna be subjective to your organization goals. Uh, you know, if you're a large cloud native organization that, uh, you know, is, is deploying, um, you know, a really critical product line, you're going to want a uh, far higher levels of throughput um, than a small team that's managing, uh, you know, kind of legacy software uh, or a new startup that's start working on a new thing. You're probably not going to need to be deploying, you know, having a throughput of, you know, hundreds uh, a, a day. You know, you're not the, the Amazons that, what is it, I think thousands, uh, tens of thousands of times they're deploying a day. Like that's just, you're not gonna need that. Uh, so, you know, it really is going to depend on your organization and, and how, how you set those. Uh, type of work, the resources, all of that. So in the data, uh, the kind of the median workflow ran about 1.54 times a day, um, but the top 5% was running uh, seven times per day. So we, in, when we look at some of the Previous reports, and I'll have it, uh, um, aggregated data to kind of show that here in a second. But you know, there wasn't much change from the previous reports. There, um, overall, the average project uh, had 2.93 um, reports that were run. I'm sorry, uh, pipeline runs in 2023, uh, which was a little bit more than 2022. Um, but you know, while it wasn't much, it, when you look at the sharp decline in Mean time to resolve, it is reflecting teams are committing to smaller, uh, more frequent changes to limit a lot of the impact that um, is had uh, to the organization and to the customer as well. All right, and throughput is really like, it is the most dependent on the other metrics uh, from any of, the, uh, any, any of the others that we kind of talked about. Um, how long your workflows take to complete. You know, if you're, you're doing something that's gonna take you it maybe takes an hour to you know compile your build, which if that's the case, then that's your metric. Um, you can't do 30 deployments in a day, just statistically not possible. So understanding what that bench line, benchmark is uh, for your org is gonna be extremely important when you look at all these metrics first. So improving that team's throughput, you've, you really have to first address all of those other underlying things before you can get to you know, how, many, uh, how successful you're getting on your deployments. Uh, it is also a trailing indicator of a lot of the other changes you have within your uh, processes and environment. So, you know, rather than setting just some arbitrary, you know, pick a number out of a hat, uh, you really got to have something that reflects your, you know, business goals, um, your needs, uh, capture that baseline across all of these metrics to understand where, how you're currently performing, uh, and then make the necessary adjustments. Achieving that right level of throughput really means uh, staying ahead of a lot of the customer needs as well. So really understanding your customer and, and have a good feel for your product. All right, so when we look at all the data, uh, you can kind of see these metrics over the last few years, see where some of the change is. Um, and, uh, you know, when you measure and then optimize these metrics, your teams uh, and your company are going to gain kind of a really tremendous advantage over organizations that don't, uh, which can set, really set you apart, have that high-performing engineering team that you really uh, everybody really wants to have right now. So uh, you can get the report. Uh, this is a link you can go out, uh, either QR code it or uh, type it in there at the bottom um, and you can kind of get the report. You don't have to down, you don't have to sign up for anything. You just hit the download button um, that Circle CI has out there uh, and uh, definitely recommend. I'm gonna post these slides as well 
so that you'll be able to uh, come back and, and reference them. Uh, go. So thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, and I'm going to be around the rest of the day and the next few days. So if you want to talk, uh, talk about you know, what you all are doing or have some questions around some of these metrics, um, we'd be happy to chat with you. So thank you.